So let's open in prayer. Lord God, we thank you. Lord, you are a sovereign God. Will you be sovereign for us today in this moment? Will you be sovereign over the words that I speak and over whatever lessons or guidance comes out of this lecture? Lord, I pray that you would testify to your presence and that you would show us that our future is secure in your hands. We can live our lives with a posture of trust because you are a good God and you hold the future. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's start with our map here today. So we're going to start in Oklahoma City and head over to the Isle of Patmos. If you're curious, we're actually going to start Revelation chapter 1 in two weeks. So we're going to spend some time there in two weeks, and we're almost there. And also just want you to be familiar with Jerusalem. We're going to talk a lot about that today. So those are going to be kind of our main sites to discuss. All right, well, I want to start in the year 1799. And that was the year that Napoleon Bonaparte was leading a military campaign through the city of Rosetta in Egypt. And one of his lieutenants came across a very interesting find in Rosetta. It was some kind of a giant Egyptian monolith that was being used to support a pillar against a temple wall. And when the soldiers took a closer look, they realized that the stone was covered with a series of strange inscriptions. Upon closer inspection, the lieutenant noticed that the mysterious writing was actually written in multiple languages. So at the top one-third of this stone, when they took a closer look, they noticed that it was Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was the language that was used for sacred and religious writings for Egyptian priests. They were very curious about what it said, but there was a problem. Nobody had been able to read hieroglyphics at that point for almost 1,300 years. It had been a lost language. And even native Egyptians had no idea what that writing said. The middle part of the stone, the 32 lines in the middle, were written in this thing called Demotic Script. It was a language that was commonly inscribed on legal documentation. But again, nobody knew how to read that portion. But then they were very excited about what they found at the bottom of the stone. It was, it was interesting because the last 53 lines were written in classical Greek. Greek was one of the most widely used languages in the ancient world, and it meant that there were plenty of interpreters who could easily read what that said. It didn't take any expert to realize what the French army had on their hands. This was likely the exact same message copied three different times in three different languages. And once they translated that bottom Greek part, which they knew how to translate, it would just be a matter of time before they could crack the code and understand the other two alphabets that had been lost to history. So what the French army had on their hands was a giant 1,700-pound decoder ring, and it held the key to understanding the ancient world. There were hundreds of unreadable manuscripts that were written in Demotic, which maybe could now be readable. And there were countless Egyptian temples and relics that had hieroglyphics on them. Maybe those could now be revealed. The Rosetta Stone, as they called it, would likely lead historians to rewrite the history books with all the new findings that they could, could muster. It would be a major understatement to say that this was the archaeological find of the century. So the translators got to work, and they breezed through the Greek, as I said, they thought to themselves, okay, now comes the easy part. Piece of cake. All we have to do is figure out the code. We'll probably be done by lunchtime. <laughs> but as they looked at the, the three languages side by side, it became apparent that there was zero connection between these alphabets. In fact, several decades later, over 23 years later, the experts were more confused than when they started. And the Rosetta Stone was still as mysterious as ever. The translators began to doubt if the lost languages would ever be recovered despite the fact that they had the key right in front of their faces. You know, today, the Rosetta Stone, it serves as an effective illustration for us as students of the Bible. You know, like that Greek writing that's on the bottom of the slab, you and I might read some of the stories in the Bible, perhaps like the life of Jesus, and for the most part, we can understand it very clearly. But like the hieroglyphics and the demotic script, there are several other unclear passages in the Bible. They're filled with ambiguity, symbols, numbers, 
mysterious prophecies that we oftentimes struggle to understand. How do we read these passages? And just like the Rosetta Stone, when we read the Bible, we often use the exact same technique that they used back then, which is we try to make sense of the unclear passages based on looking at the passages we know. So the Bible itself talks about a scenario in Acts chapter 8 that's very similar to this, where someone has to wrestle with an unclear passage of prophecy. Maybe you've had to do that at some point. It's just a passage, maybe it's in Ezekiel, you have no idea what it says. So this passage describes an Ethiopian eunuch who had just acquired a scroll from the prophet Isaiah. A disciple named Philip sees the eunuch struggling to read the scroll and decides to go help him out. So in verse 28, it says, Philip asks him, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless somebody explains it to me. Here's what Isaiah has written. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Put yourself in the eunuch's place for just a moment. He's reading a document that is over 700 years old, written by a man that he never knew, about a man that he has never heard of, coming from a culture that's entirely foreign to him, using symbolism that he's unfamiliar with, referring to historic events that he never even knew happened. What chance did the eunuch have to read that prophecy and say, oh, I get it, a sheep to the slaughter, of course. I think I must follow Jesus now. There's no way he's going to do that. To the eunuch, it's an unclear passage, and it was like a door without a key. Oftentimes, we are a lot like the confused eunuch. We find ourselves in need of a key to unlock the door to understand prophecy. So as we study the book of Revelation this year, we're going to encounter numerous doors that appear to be locked to us, to our understanding. And some doors are locked because of mysterious symbolism and numerology. Some doors are locked because we don't have the right context or we don't understand how it's going to be fulfilled in prophecy, without the key to unlock the doors of prophecy, we remain like the eunuch, unable to take to heart what we can't understand. So it leads us to this personal question. What will it take for us to actually understand the word of God? Do you understand, for instance, the events surrounding the second coming of Christ? How well would you do, how confident would you be in understanding that? Do you understand how to identify false teachers in the world today? Or how to guard yourself against the eventual rise of an antichrist figure? More importantly, do you understand what God's word says about the decision that you should make tomorrow in the difficult situation you're facing right now? Maybe you've wondered if gaining understanding of the Bible is just a matter of buying a better study Bible. We just need to listen to more commentaries, or maybe just put in more hours in our Bible. Maybe if we learned Greek and Hebrew, then maybe you could unlock the mysteries of the Bible. Others have tried all of these things to no avail. So what will it take for you to actually understand the word of God so you can take it to heart? But here's what's at stake. How can we follow something that we don't understand? It's important. How can we be transformed by the truth of prophecy unless we can grasp what it means? So after decades of no one understanding the lost languages of the Rosetta Stone, here's what Jean-Francois Champollion decided to try radically different. He thought to himself, everyone's already tried matching Greek to Egyptian word for word. But what if we instead focused on how the words sounded? Sure enough, this idea actually worked. It turns out the Egyptian language is phonetic. You must speak it to read it. The key to unlocking the mystery of the Rosetta Stone was to stop looking at the words and to start listening. Here's how we can use this lesson today to understand Bible prophecy. When we're overwhelmed by the words and the symbols and the mysteries that we can't make any sense of, that's the moment we must listen all the more carefully to the sound of God's voice. You may be thinking, you know, I've never heard the voice of God. How do I do that? How does this work? Well, it turns out the voice of God is described throughout the Bible. 
So we can study the Bible to understand the Bible. In its prophetic passages, we see the voice of God. And we can recognize his voice and better understand how to read them. So let's look at four different aspects today of hearing the voice of God in prophecy in the Bible. So we can better understand what he is saying. So first off, we're going to look at the different mouthpieces that God uses to speak his prophetic message. The mouthpieces. Number two, we're going to look at the surprising way that God unfolds each part of the prophecy. And then number three, let's look at how when God speaks, he manages to say more than we realize he's saying at first. And then lastly, let's look at how God repeats himself over and over and over again throughout the ages. So let's start at the mouthpiece of God. So many men and even some women have been called by God throughout the pages of the Bible to speak God's prophetic word. God doesn't often pick just Bible heroes or, or kings or high priests or any of those kinds of figures. Instead, he often picks the unlikely servant. Consider this young person, the prophet Jeremiah, who was chosen to become a prophet at a very young age. Here's what it says in Jeremiah 1.4. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, before, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go wherever I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? You see, through the mouth of Jeremiah, God would speak about destruction and about captivity, some of the hardest messages. God knew that no matter who the messenger was, it would be rejected by a hard-hearted audience. Another unlikely servant rose up in the prophet Moses. So Moses had been a humble shepherd in Midian, and then one day at the age of 80, he encountered the voice of God in a burning bush. In Exodus 4, Moses approached the voice of God and was called to carry on a prophetic message to Egypt. But Moses said to the Lord, pardon your, your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send somebody else. <laughs> I like how he adds that in there. It's, it's hard to not laugh when you read that. So reluctantly, Moses ends up accepting God's call. And he began, became the mouthpiece for God's judgment before Pharaoh. And just like Jeremiah, the credentials of a prophet weren't made, weren't the ones who made the, the message profound or effective. Instead, it was the one who forged the message. It was God who gave the words power and certain fulfillment. So as we look through the Bible, there's plenty of other righteous men who carried the message of God. But that wasn't always the case. Just to keep us on our toes, God reminds us every once in a while that he can choose to speak whomever he pleases. Here's what it says in John 11:50. The high priest named Caiaphas, and he was a man who passionately hated Jesus, here's what he said. He said, you do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that whole nation perish. John then adds this commentary. He says, he did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. We learn this time and time again in the Bible, that God can still shoot a bullseye with a crooked arrow. So here we go for our first principle. Everyone and everything is capable of hearing the voice of God. 
If you ask Google to define the word prophecy, you're going to find a very bad definition, in my opinion. We typically believe that prophecy is just about telling the future and predicting things. But on the contrary, prophecy is about so much more than that. A better definition is this. Prophecy is dis discerning the voice of God. The voice of God it will not be restricted to just kings or poets or Bible heroes. Old men and young men will hear the voice of God. Those who seek God will hear the voice of God. Those who are in need of repentance will hear the voice of God. The sick, the lonely, the poor, they will hear the voice of God. Broken men who have thoughts of suicide will hear the voice of God. You and I can receive the, the words of prophecy in our everyday life by hearing from the voice of the Holy Spirit. God will speak to you about conviction of sin. He'll speak about divine insight of what Bible passages mean. He'll speak about the meaning of Scripture in the past, present, future is all prophecy from God. Here's what Psalm 29 says about hearing the voice of God in our world today. It says, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry glory. It's amazing, the voice of God, the prophetic voice of God everywhere declaring his glory and his sovereignty over every living creature. Animals, trees, weather systems, mountains, people, even you and I. All of God's creation is listening to the voice of God, but are you? The question is this, are we listening to what he's saying today? Are we willing to slow our lives down to the pace where we can actually seek him and hear his words? When the prophet Samuel heard the voice of God in the stillness of the night, this advice was given to him. If he calls you again, Samuel, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Is that the posture you have? Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. We must be still and know that he is God. And when we pause for a minute and we listen closely to his voice, we prepare ourselves to receive the new understanding that he's going to give us. It'll be about his will. It'll be about his nature. It could be about his word. What might God say to you this year when you stop to ask him and listen closely to his voice? So next, as we look beyond how to just receive God's voice, let's take some time and consider the message that he's bringing us. What is he going to say? So often God's message is very complicated as we see through scripture. It's hard to understand at the time it's given. Look at the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 37. It says, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. You see, Ezekiel admitted he had no idea what was going on as this prophecy was revealed to him. And to add to the confusion, the prophecies of Ezekiel that he received referred to events that were jumbled throughout all of history. They were in no particular order. Ezekiel was given words that spanned several thousand years, some of which have still not taken place yet. God gave Ezekiel prophetic words that he couldn't possibly have acted on because it was beyond his lifetime. He was simply meant to record them for future generations and to tell the world. The prophecies of Israel, or of Isaiah, sorry, were also entirely out of order. Even within the same sentence, Isaiah's prophecies would jump thousands of years throughout history. Look at Isaiah 61. One verse uh, which speaks about the time of Christ. He says, The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
There's actually even a verse in Luke chapter 4 where Jesus reads those exact prophetic words. But he stops. After he says this part has been fulfilled, he stops to not read the second part of the sentence. Here's what it says. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. The day of vengeance has still yet to come. We've been waiting thousands of years for the day of God's judgment. But if you look through the pages of Isaiah, the 66 chapters of that book, you're going to find chapter 11 talks about the future. Chapter 7 talks about the time of Christ. Chapter 15 talks about 700 B.C. Chapter 53 talks about the time of Christ. Chapter 65 talks about the end of the world. It's all over the map. How can you possibly follow it? There's no order. There's no visible pattern. It's as if God's prophetic timeline was put in a blender and then thrown into the wind. But why should we be surprised about how God doesn't give it to us in order? Because God is infinite. He dwells outside of the perception of time. God sees the end from the beginning. And because he transcends time, his message weaves all of human history into one intertwined tapestry. So here's my second principle. The voice of God doesn't follow human timelines. The prophetic voice of God throughout the Bible is understandably, it's diff difficult to organize because we like to think about the order of things and keep things sequenced in a way our human minds can understand them. When we talk to God, we use words like soon or now or this year. But 2 Peter 3 reminds us that God's timetable is nothing like ours. He warns us, do not forget this one thing. Dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. God is patient with us. He's patient with his prophetic plan. And as every thousand years ticks away on our human clocks, God isn't rushed, he isn't hurried, he isn't surprised. Before his infinite throne, 500 B.C., 2024 A.D., 4 B.C., 700 B.C., they're all just different threads of the tapestry that he weaves together. God looks at the big picture, and he isn't hurried. Therefore, we have to read his word with a sensitivity to the fact that we may be constrained to a time and a place, but God is not. We will be tempted to make assumptions in his word, about God's voice believing that this must follow that in the Bible. We we'll want to think that our idea of soon is like God's idea of soon. But with the, day, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. But what he has spoken, it will come to pass at just the perfect moment, the moment that he has designed. Why do we still struggle to surrender to and to be patient with God's unfailing timeline. So one of the key frustrations because of the fact that everything's out of order, this shuffled timeline that we get, is the fact that we're left sorting out the pieces. How do we put the puzzle back together? We have to try to glue together all of Bible prophecy, and it's no easy job. As we read prophecy, we have to ask ourselves, how should I understand this passage? Is this a prophecy that was already fulfilled before, or is it still yet to be fulfilled? Or is it not ever meant to be fulfilled literally, and it's just a symbol? So no matter how we answer all those questions about prophecy, we can all agree that all of God's prophecies are completely true. But that doesn't mean that we all interpret it the same way. And because of this, so much of our churches have become divided about Bible interpretation, not sure which is, is talking about which era of time. And after all, the way we understand the meaning of God's prophecy, it does massively change how you respond to it. How you live out your faith is very different based on how you read prophecy. For example, some of us Christians believe that the prophecies of the Bible should be understood as symbols. So we, the people who have that view, we would call them polemicists. So they read the Bible like its prophecies are filled with parables and myths, fables, allegories, spiritual lessons. 
And they have a good reason to believe that because Jesus often spoke in parables. Matthew 13 says, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He didn't say anything to them without using a parable. So a polemicist hears the voice of God and looks for its symbolism. They want to understand the moral of the story. They want to know, they want to be able to say that the, the details aren't really that big of a deal because the point of the Bible is to give us an object lesson in what is right and wrong and show us what God's doing about it. Parables like the prodigal son do an excellent job of teaching us about the nature of grace, more so than a dictionary or an encyclopedia would. So many of you in this crowd right now, you might call yourselves polemicists. But then along comes a historicist, and he looks at the polemicist and says, you are wrong, buddy. You've got it all wrong. That's not how you understand the voice of God. The historicist would say, the Bible reveals a record of the church history. They might say, maybe there are some symbols and metaphors, that's fine, but they all serve to connect God's plan with the unfolding events of human history. A historicist might look at Martin Luther when he started the Reformation and say, oh, look, the book of Revelation talked about that. They might look at May 1948 when the Jewish people reestablished the nation of Israel. And again, they'll say, look, the, the book of Revelation talked about that. Truly, many of the events of the last 2,000 years, they have confirmed that the, the Bible parallels church and world history. But in a historicist, we'll see God's prophetic voice as events unfolding over this 2,000-year period since Christ. But then next comes the preterist, who looks at the polemicist and the historicist, and again, he shakes his head. He says, no, 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 no. You've got it all wrong. That's not how you understand the voice of God. Because they say that everything in the Bible, including most of the book of Revelation, has already been fulfilled in the first century. They would say that the great tribulation that we're going to read about this year took place in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem and they persecuted the early church. So the preterist would direct us to the first verse of the book of Revelation. And it shows us that the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, what must soon take place? See, the whole book was written in the first century, so you can make an argument that maybe this is all stuff that was, was uh, contemporary to the writer. So to recap, the polemicist says the whole thing's an allegory. The historicist says it's the church age. The preterist says this is all the first century. But then we get one more view. Along comes the futurist. He looks at the other three viewpoints. He says, guys, you, again, you've got it all wrong. That's not how you interpret the voice of God. Let me explain. The Bible is pointing to events that are all yet to come. Jesus hasn't yet physically returned or reigned on the earth. There hasn't been a widespread resurrection of believers. We haven't uncovered the Antichrist yet. And a futurist reminds us to look in Mark 13. It says, those will be days of distress, unequaled from the beginning, when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Can anyone really say that was something that happened uh, 1,900 years ago? What's, what's coming must still be yet to come. So here we are with four totally different perspectives on how to understand the word of God. All four make very convincing arguments. All four quote scripture to defend their view. And they can all point to great theologians who agree with them. Honestly, nothing about all four views is blatantly wrong. And if you have those views in BSF, you're perfectly welcome to have them. But we're still left wondering, how should I understand the voice of God? Well, it turns out there is a fifth view that I like. <laughs> what if all four camps are simultaneously right? What if all four perspectives are just revealing something about God? God in his infinite wisdom is actually able to simultaneously speak about past, present, future, and allegory all at the same time. It leads us to a verse in Ecclesiastes. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. So here's my third principle. The voice of God has a depth of meaning. 
regardless of whichever view you have of prophecy, we can all marvel at how scripture is given to us as a God-breathed living word. How dare we try to fit God's word into a box, into a single category of human thinking. Here's what Isaiah 55 says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, in hindsight, we can look at God's prophecies and peel back layer after layer after layer of truth like an onion. The words, the word of God that he's given us in the past, they're so clearly proven to come from a transcendent intellect. God is brilliant. He speaks from multiple points of views at the same time, all the while maintaining perfect truth and relevance to our cultures today. Every generation who reads it finds new truth. Billy Graham once said this, he said, the Bible is unlike the books of men. It does not change or get out of date. Therefore, when we listen to God's voice, we shouldn't be presumptive. We shouldn't be quick to jump to conclusions about what it means because God is saying more than our human minds can fathom. And in the layers of truth that God gives us, we can praise him for giving us truth for today and bright hope for tomorrow. His word is alive. We say that, but we need to mean it. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. So how quickly do you simplify and boil down God's word? What needs to change to start looking for more truth beyond just a basic interpretation of his word? So this verse, what has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. It shows us that, that God can speak to us about multiple things at the same time. But it also reveals that God repeats himself over and over and over again throughout Bible history. So let me show you a couple examples of how God repeats himself. This is really going to help us in Revelation because there's so much repetition. So in the days of Abraham... God demanded a blood sacrifice of his son, Isaac, on a mountaintop. But God intervened and provided a substitute to be sacrificed. And in the end, Isaac was saved by the blood of the sacrifice. Then you fast forward centuries later, and God instructs the Israelites in Egypt to sacrifice a lamb and use the blood to mark the doorway of their home. The lamb died, giving its blood so that death would pass over their home. And the next morning, all who relied on the blood of the lamb were saved. And then once again, much later, Jesus would go to the cross as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus would give his life as a substitute for our sinful lives. And by the blood of the perfect lamb, we can be saved. Do you see the repeated message here? God provides a substitute the blood is poured out so we can be saved. God provides a substitute. The blood is poured out so we can be saved. God provides a substitute. The blood is poured out so we can be saved. I showed you last week about the sevenfold repeated pattern of Babylon. This applies here too. The message is this. People become prideful. They rebel against God and their efforts fail. People become prideful. They rebel against God and their efforts fail. People become prideful, they rebel against God, their efforts fail. It's just seven times over, you can see the same thing happen. It's a repeated message that reminds us, it warns us, and it shows us the danger that we face. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. In the Garden of Eden, we see another pattern. Mankind sins and is banished then God makes a promise of hope that Satan's head would one day be crushed by a savior. Then hope is delivered when Jesus is born in a manger in Bethlehem. In the kingdom of Israel, Israel sinned and played with idolatry and they were carried away, they were banished. God offered the promise of the coming king of kings who would rule with righteousness and then God delivered us to Jesus to reign forever and ever at the right hand of the Father. And then today, what we find is that we live in a world that keeps falling into patterns of sin and depravity. But God made a promise for his son to return, to destroy death and to judge the wicked. 
And today we wait on the next phase of this repetition, which is for God to deliver us from evil once again. So here's the pattern. Hope is needed. Hope is promised. Hope is delivered. Hope is needed. Hope is promised. Hope is delivered. Hope is needed. Hope is promised. And do you believe that hope will be delivered once more? Here's my final principle. The voice of God speaks a message that bears repeating. For extra emphasis, God has been repeating the same messages throughout the Bible. And if we want to understand what his repeated pattern is, we would be wise to look at what has already been said. If you want to see the repetition of the pattern, you've got to look in the Old Testament and other parts of the New Testament. All four of these principles lead us back to the question that we had in the beginning. What will it take for us to actually understand the word of God? We can't follow what we can't understand. We can't understand without listening carefully to the voice of God. In our own relationship and as we read the Bible, we've got to listen to his voice. But if we listen closely to his voice, here's what we're going to find. God will speak to anyone who seeks him. God will speak words that are timeless and unchanging. God will speak with a depth of meaning. And just in case we weren't paying attention, God will repeat the message again and again and again. As Jesus once said to his disciples, do you still not understand? We must trust the voice of God. It is the key to unlocking Bible prophecy. When we finally open our ears to hear his voice and seek him for answers, we will see the prophecies of God begin to become unveiled to us. His sheep know his voice. Are you one of his sheep? Where will you follow him to gain new understanding in the year ahead? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for Bible prophecy because it allows us to trust you completely. We see that what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. You have been doing the same thing since the beginning and you will keep doing it until the end. And so as we look for hope in this dark world, we look that the hope was, was needed Hope was promised and hope was delivered. Hope was needed, hope was promised, and hope was delivered. And we believe that hope will be delivered once more when your son Jesus comes in the, in the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, Lord. So we, along with those who will stand on that day, Lord, we seek the coming of your son Jesus. We look forward to it. And we, we look forward to the hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everyone.